he, he died in one shot. What? This video is sponsored by Netmarble. Yo, what's up guys, it's Power Bang, and as you saw in the intro, we have just destroyed Varkaron in zero seconds. This is a guide on how to accomplish the strongest of feats in Lineage 2 Revolution. Now, I'm not gonna promise zero seconds, but I am gonna break down the different clan dungeons today. We're talking Varkaron as well as Queen Ant. I'm gonna help you guys understand the fights, what the abilities are for those bosses, how to best avoid their damage, and what the best strategies are as a clan to take these guys down efficiently. If you're sitting there wondering what in the heck is Power Bang talking about, well, download the game. It's in the description below, and then if you guys wanna come play on my server, I'm in Kruma 2. All of my Lineage 2 information is right over here. Here, check that out. Now before we get into the nitty gritty of how to take these bosses down, let's first talk about why you want to do so in the first place. Clan dungeons are in fact one of the best places to get forgotten scrolls, which are the pages that you need to craft your rare abilities and also level them up. Whether it's Missile Bolt, Meteor Storm, Healing Strike, or Absolute Shield, rare abilities will set your character apart and will give them superpowers, like huge amounts of damage or greatly increased defense, whether in the form of healing or damage mitigation. That is one thing you can for sure take away from the clan dungeons. Now, in addition to the chance that you might open up a forgotten scroll page from one of your chests that you get off medium or hard mode of either Varkaron or Queen Ant, you also will guaranteed get one as a clan if you do finish medium or hard mode. Those pages will go into your clan loot vault and your leader can actually distribute those at a time of your choosing, whether that's weekly or bi-weekly. The goal being to gear up your clan from top to bottom as thoroughly as possible. So when your clan does dungeons in the future, or perhaps you guys are battling on the fortress siege, you guys will be as strong as possible collectively from top to bottom. But Forgotten Scrolls are not the only thing that clan dungeons are good for. All kinds of loot to help your characters out is available from Adina to enhancement scrolls to herbs and a load of weapon and armor boxes, including those uncommon accessories you guys can actually collect as a clan and give those away as well as part of your guys' loot giveaways. Now, in almost any MMO, Lineage 2 Revolution included, there are four main components to a well-balanced party. Let's go over those now so that everybody's clear on what type of characters they need to bring to these boss fights. Now, many of you guys are professionals and you already know this, you've got prior MMO experience, but for those that don't, I wanna break down very quickly what these four groups are. You've got tanks, healers, ranged DPS, and melee DPS. DPS stands for damage per second. These are your damage dealers. You also have tanks. Tanks are those that have high hit points and high defense and that are designed to be able to taunt the boss or taunt the enemy troops so that they are attacking it and not the rest of your damage dealers, which are typically a little bit more fragile. So your tanks hold the aggro. Aggro is basically the aggression of the enemy bosses or mobs, and then the healers are designed to heal the tanks and also any other stragglers in the group who happen to accidentally take damage. If the tank loses aggro or dies, you don't want that to happen, but it does occasionally. That's why it's good to sometimes bring an off tank or a backup tank that you guys can taunt the boss back and forth between. So when one is taking just too much damage and is going to die, even with the healer keeping him up, the other can taunt the boss away away from him to allow him to recuperate his health. And that is kind of the most complex class role in a boss fight. You've got your tanks and your healers. Responsibilities are a little bit, uh, you know, more on those classes than it is for the damage dealers. Damage dealers are simply there to burst down the boss as quickly as possible, take care of adds as quickly as possible. We'll get to that more in the Queen Ant fight. But the DPS classes need to stay out of harm's way for the most part, which means that it's very helpful for if a tank is facing a boss one direction, meaning the tank is maybe on the left side of the boss, it would be great if the melee DPS, for the most part, is on the right side of the boss. That way, if the boss is swinging his sword wildly in front of his body, doing damage to the tank, he's not also cleaving or doing damage to multiple characters all at once, making the healer's job much, much more difficult. So let me put together a diagram on the screen right now that kind of shows you guys a, uh, a little bit of an example on how you might stagger your classes in a particular particular boss fight. The key thing to note in your party formations inside of clan 
dungeons is that healers can only heal those within their actual party. So you might have 20 people inside of your clan dungeon and you might have four of those are healers, but if you don't have a healer in every party or if one party is absent a healer, the tanks in that party, the damage dealers in that party, every member in that party will not be able to be healed even if there's a healer in the clan standing directly next to them. Now that you've got your healers distributed properly within your different parties, make sure that your positioning in the actual dungeon is appropriate. You want your healers to be in range of your party's tank as well as your party's DPS. Now your DPS needs to be separated from your tank so that the damage done to the tank is not done across all of your members. You want it to be as efficient as possible and when your healer has to cast a heal, you want that healer to be focused specifically on the tank. So that's kind of how you should position yourself and from a macro, a clan perspective, you want to make sure that your clan is not all stacked up on the tank as well. Make sure that uh, the, the tanks are kind of on one side and the melee DPS is on another. The ranged is also sitting at maximum range for, for the most part. So if any of the ranged DPS actually takes over aggro from a tank by doing too much damage, yes, you can steal aggro if you're a really, really hard hitting Phantom Ranger or a different range class. If that does happen, the more distance you have between you and the boss, the more time that there is to correct, realize that aggro has changed, and you can actually make adjustments, run away, kite the boss, make any kind of adjustment that you need to do before it's uh, all kind of gone off the tracks. It's time to get to the tactics. Let's get into the first dungeon that we're going to talk about today, and that is Varkaron. He's got four different difficulty levels. Very easy. Easy, medium, hard. As the difficulty levels get harder and harder, Varkaron will actually have more abilities and more dangerous helpers he's gonna bring to the fight. Now, Varkaron's got about five abilities that he brings to battle. First is his primary attack. If you're the one holding aggro, his primary attack, you're gonna suffer the blow of his mighty weapon, and there's really not much that you can do to avoid it. Now, if you're a melee DPS class, just stay away from the tank. You can avoid it just fine. Now, if you're a healer or ranged DPS, just stay out of the range of Vark's melee attack and stay at max range for your personal abilities and you should be just fine. Next, we've got what's called the Blood Blade. The Blood Blade is something Varkaron uses quite often and it's a frontal attack with a cone area of effect damage in front of Varkaron. This means that for the melee DPS that are standing behind Vark, this is a very good place to stand as that Blood Blade attack will not affect them. For most ranged DPS classes and healers, the Blood Blade is not an issue as their range does go farther than the Blood Blade's range. Next up, we've got the Blood Reverb, which is known as Vark's Jump. His jump ability is pretty much telegraphed by the red area of effect damage indicator on the floor of the dungeon. So when you see that, you want to make sure that if you're a ranged character, that you back up out of range as quickly as possible. There's very little time to delay, and if you mess up, you will actually incur a stun, and your character will be incapacitated for three seconds. The more you guys get stunned as a group, the more detrimental it is to your ability to keep the tank healed up and ultimately catch up on healing across your entire party. For the melee classes and the tanks, you can actually start to time when this ability is going to be because he does this in sequential order, but for the most part when you're starting out, I wouldn't worry about this too much. Just make sure that your tank and your melee DPS are not stacked up on top of each other and just go ahead, sit through the stun and continue damage as soon as you're out of the stun. At that point, it's the healer's job to top you guys off on health and get you back into the fight. Now every so often throughout this fight, Varkaron will activate his blood shield. The blood shield will make him immune to all damage and he'll actually spawn a bunch of helpers such as Dark Lords, which are very, very high hit point and high damage output mobs that will be there in mass to help him out. Now while Varkaron is immune to damage, your whole clan and party and everybody inside the clan dungeon wants to focus their DPS on these adds to take them down as quickly as possible. Not only can they do a lot of damage to you, but also, Varkaron can heal during this time, and he'll replenish some of the hit points that he lost during the earlier stages of battle. The last thing to take note of that Varkaron will do is that when he gets under half of his hit points, he'll actually go into a Berserk mode. Now, in Berserk mode, he'll actually start to dash to his target, and when he dashes, you'll see a tiny red circle on the ground that is his destination, and he will be dashing around doing damage and using his primary attack 
but it's pretty difficult to actually judge your range. You just have to be aware that he does this. Now, after he does his dash and while he's in Berserk, you can expect a blood reverb that's his jump after the second dash. This sequence will pretty much go on for the entire fight. As long as you remember to stay at max range for your range DPS and healers and not to stack up on top of each other for your melee DPS and tanks, you guys should be okay. Run out of the range of his jump if at all possible. If you're a range character or a healer, that's going to be super important for continuing DPS and continuing healing while your melee character is getting beaten up pretty badly. As a melee character, unless you have a really good understanding of the, the order and the mechanics of the fight, it's very difficult to avoid the blood reverb. Now, as the adds continue to spawn, just make sure to burn them down as fast as possible and get back to fighting Vark, and you guys will be good to go. Collecting those forgotten scroll pages and that loot in no time at all. Now that we've talked about Varkaron, let's go ahead and focus our attention on the Queen Ant Dungeon. Now, the Queen Ant Clan Dungeon is a step up from Varkaron. In my opinion, the Varkaron fight is actually a little bit harder mechanically, but the the Queen Ant fight takes more CP to be competitive, and it's definitely for the higher caliber clans and players. Now, as far as loot goes, there's not a lot of difference between Queen Ant and Varkaron. The main difference is in the Forgotten Scroll pages, which are used to craft your rare abilities and level them up. If you're looking to build a Meteor Storm, Queen Ant is definitely the place to go to do that. If you're looking for Healing Strike, Varkaron is the better option. In each clan dungeon, you have the opportunity as an individual who participated to actually get a page as part of your loot chest, and the clan itself is guaranteed a couple of pages if you complete these bosses on medium or hard mode. So let's talk about the fight. Let's talk about the boss. Let's talk about what she can do. The premise of the fight essentially is you're going to do a bunch of damage to the queen ant and then she's going to be a coward and she's going to go underground and hide for a while where she's immune to all damage. During this time, she's going to summon a bunch of helpers, the hive mind, and they will come to her aid. You will have to fight them off and ultimately this cycle will happen uh, several times during the course of the fight until finally you persevere and take down the queen ant. Now, while she is out of the ground, she does have several main abilities that she will use, and I will highlight those now. First and foremost is her primary attack. Pretty obvious. It's a single target damage to whoever is holding aggro. Same as Vark, and it is going to be your main tank in all likelihood. In addition to the primary attack, there are two main abilities that are used in like a frontal AoE. It's like a straight line in front of the boss. So if you're standing in front next to the main tank, watch out. They hit hard. One of these is Pounce. Now, Pounce Pounce is telegraphed by the boss. There's a big red, looks like an arrow coming out of the front of the boss on the ground. If you're standing in that red area, you need to leave it immediately because Pounce will hit you. Now, this is a direct damage. Uh, it hits pretty hard. You just want to avoid it, and it's not really that hard to do so. The next ability that she's going to use is Spit Poison. This is the one that you kind of want to be careful of. It's probably the third most dangerous attack on the Queen Ant fight. Spit Poison is basically the same frontal attack, except for this one does damage over time to your character, and this can put healers behind on healing very quickly if you're affected with this. So again, stay away from the Queen, attack it from the side, let your tank take the brunt of the damage. If you get hit with Spit Poison, this is going to do, uh, you know, fast thousands of damage a tick, and that is not something that you want to have happen. Next up for her abilities, you've got Fear Moans. Now, yes, she is going to cast her Fear Moans on the ground, and these come in the shape of little red circles that ooze like poison-looking green and purpley clouds, and this will do heavy damage over time to you. I'm talking if you stand in that for three or four seconds, you will die regardless of your strength. The Fear Moans mean business. So luckily, these are very obvious to see. What you can do is kind of call these out in chat. You can bind a command if necessary, or if you use a voice chat system outside of the game, just say, hey, yo, you're standing in a puddle, move. So those are pheromones. Watch out for those. She casts them on the ground periodically throughout the fight. As we kind of mentioned in the summary, the queen ant can also disappear and reappear. When she disappears, she goes immune to all damage. You can no longer damage the queen. And at this point is when a bunch of adds and summoned ants will come to her rescue. There are a bunch of different types of adds that come out. You first have the ant larva, you've got the ant soldiers, you have the nurse ants, and you also have the self-destructive ants. Now, to break down these different types of adds a little bit more, the ant larva are very similar to what you'd find in the ant's nest one and two elite dungeons. They don't do a lot of damage, but in large groups, they can be a little bit annoying. 
These are your lowest priority to kill. Next up, you've got the ant soldiers. Ant soldiers probably do the most damage uh, as far as the ant adds, uh, with the exception of the self-destructive ants. We'll talk about those in just a second. But as far as direct damage, uh, these ant soldiers do a lot of damage. And when they get together in groups, they can take you down really, really quickly. So these you want to focus on killing, uh, but not before you take out those nurse ants. The nurse ants are basically healers for the other ants, and those need to be a focus fire priority when you see them, because that just kind of keeps up this swarm and if the swarm isn't dead before the queen comes back up from underground, you've got double trouble. You've got the ads that you have to deal with and the queen ad at the same time, and that can get a little bit chaotic for sure. The last ad type is the self-destructive ant. Now, these are the fire ants, essentially. You're going to see them. They're very obvious. They're on fire, and these can end your life in just one explosion. If you're weak and if you're a stronger character, two or three of these guys will certainly take you down. Fire ants are no joke. The way they work is they're essentially a ticking time bomb. If you do not kill them in a certain amount of time, and it's not that long, as soon as you see them, you basically have uh, probably around 10 seconds or less to kill them. And if you do not kill them in this particular amount of time, they will explode and everything in their radius will essentially die. That is not something you want, so number one priority always is the fire ants. If you can't kill them, make sure that you have somebody kite them away from everyone else. It's basically shooting them to get their attention and moving away from the crowd. To have these guys go off in a crowd can end the raid really quickly. To have them go off on just one person, eh, it's okay. So now you know all the Queen Ant's abilities, let's go ahead and arm you guys with some tips on how to defeat her. There's actually two main ways that my clan has actually used to make this happen. The first of which is basically a kill on sight method that is really, really good for stronger clans. Stronger clans that have a lot of damage and can kill the adds very quickly when the Queen Ant goes underground, probably want to employ this strategy. Basically, the way it works is as follows. For both methods, you want to make sure that you have a healer in your tank's party, obviously, and the tank is going to face the queen away from the main group of people towards where she spawns. You want her to face away so that Pounce and Spit Poison do not hit the main group of melee DPS and even some of the ranged DPS that may be close to her. Every single time she disappears, with the exception of the main tank, Every single person in the raid will go to the ads that spawn towards the actual uh, player spawn and all over the map. You want to take out the ads and focus fire them down as quickly as possible so they all die before the queen ant surfaces and is ready to fight again. The main tank should stay by where the queen goes underground so when she surfaces he can engage her and pick up the fight right where it left off. Once the players have finished off the adds, then they can return to the queen to engage her in battle and do more damage until the next time she goes underground. Rinse and repeat this strategy until she ultimately dies. Word of caution, the ants will actually start to spawn uh, more and faster towards the end of the fight, so the queen is a little bit harder to kill. And just keep in mind that the damage on the queen doesn't necessarily matter. It's all about killing the adds and making sure that they ultimately don't wipe your raid they are the ones to watch out for with regards to damage because the momentum is where this is dangerous if you allow enough momentum to get built up amongst the ads to you know once they start killing off people if they take down a key healer or if they take down your tank that is where things go south very quickly because then aggro is distributed around to everyone and then the whole raid is dead and she resets and you have a bad day. The other method I would recommend for weaker CP clans to have a hard time killing the ants in a fast enough time. What you want to do is basically dedicate a specific party in your raid ad patrol. You guys are responsible for shooting the ads and kiting them around, keeping them away from the main damage dealer to the queen ant, and especially your main tank and main healers. Once you guys have kited these guys around, you're kind of doing damage to them the whole time to keep them interested in chasing you, but ultimately this strategy can backfire if the people that are kiting all of the ads around die or they get pinned between the ads and a wall, which is kind of frequent. Uh, you can get pinned between the pillars, between the walls, all kinds of stuff. Then it's really, really bad because the next person with like high aggro, if those people die, is typically the main tank, and that's where all of those ants go. And if you're not killing him, it can build up a ton of 
of ants, a ton of momentum, and it's really hard to overcome that. So that's a strategy that we did use for a while. I like the focus fire much better, but you guys can, if you're feeling crafty and sneaky and you're gonna try something that's a little bit above your punching weight, remember that you can kite the ads around and not really kill them, but just make sure that you're organized in capturing their attention and directing it away from what matters, which is your damage dealers. So that's pretty much all the detail that I have on the Queen Ant fight. I hope it was sufficient, and I hope you guys are now armed with the tools you need to be successful on your clan dungeons. Varkaron has four main modes, as we talked about, and he goes all the way up to 39.2 million HP on the hard mode, which is quite a bit of HP. But if you look at the Queen Ant, she goes all the way up to 67.5 million, so she almost has double the amount of hit points of Varkaron. So it's definitely a higher CP fight. I know it, it recommends 439,000 uh, combat power to go into the Queen Ant fight. You don't really need that much combat power. It's just going to take longer. I do recommend that you guys start getting, uh, you know, close to the combat power recommendation before you try to attempt it. At least make sure your main tank or whoever's holding aggro is close to at where they should be when you attempt these fights. So now you guys are armed with all kinds of data to go ahead and take these monsters down in your clan dungeons. So get back out there, share with your clan these videos to make sure that you guys all have all of the information necessary so everybody's on the same page. And uh, tell me in the comments what you guys' best time is on these dungeons. I know Varkaron for us, we do pretty much in zero seconds on uh, very easy and easy. Uh, but on hard, I, I, I want to say it's about a minute on hard. And then our queen ant on hard is also so just getting below five minutes right now. Uh, so it definitely is going to get lower and lower as time goes on and the players get stronger. But I want to know what your guys' best times are so far. And if you haven't downloaded the game yet to play Lineage 2 Revolution and actually, you know, record a best time, do it. Links in the description below. Thank you to Netmarble for sponsoring this video. That is all I have for this one. I will be back in the near future with more Lineage 2 Revolution guides and videos. This is Power Bang. I'll catch you guys in the next one.